What's the deal with everyone saying that dwarven women are meant to have beards? Is that from the books? It's like a bizarre fan fascination. Tolkien never says dwarven women have beards. I love action Galadriel. Love it. I just, I just love it. Hi, my name is Corey Olson, the Tolkien Professor. I'm president of Signum University, and I've been doing a podcast on Tolkien called The Tolkien Professor for more than 10 years now. And I'm going to be talking today about the new teaser trailer for The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, and also talking about some of the recently released images uh, from the show coming up. It began long ago. So the first age, second age, third age, they basically end at cataclysmic battles with the Dark Lord, essentially. <laughs> All three of the ages end that way. That's, 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 that's how we transition from one age to another. The first age, the oldest age, it starts with Sauron's boss, right? So Sauron's boss, whose name was Morgoth, is ruling in Middle-earth. And so he was the big bad. Sauron worked for him. Sauron was like his number two guy. Eventually, the elves from Valinor return to Middle-earth to rescue the few remaining survivors who haven't gotten ground into a pulp by Morgoth already at that point. The first age is like super depressing. Everything goes downhill. All of the beautiful civilizations that are built are eventually crushed and almost everybody dies. Like it's like can be super depressing, <laughs> right? And then there's a sudden turn and the elves from Valinor from the west come over and they return and they fight against Morgoth and they overcome him and they take him prisoner and he gets cast into outer darkness and that's the end of him and that's the end of the first age. It's done. In the second age then, that's where all of this, that the second age is where this series is taking place. So that begins with the establishment of Numenor when the Valars reward the humans. A lot of the elves are invited to return into the West, return back to Elvenholm, to Valinor in the West. And most of them go, but some of them choose to stay. We got unfinished business. We want to stay in Middle-earth. There's still stuff that we want to do here. And those are the elves that we're going to be meeting. Galadriel is one of them. She's a very important one. Gilgalad, the High King of the Noldor. Celebrimbor, the guy who forges the Rings of Power. Elrond, who is like the, you know, like staff officer of Gilgalad. So you've got those elves. And then you've got Numenor being established, right? So Sauron, who was, again, he was number two under Morgoth, the big bad of the first age, begins to establish his own power. And so you've got the, the Rings of Power stuff, him deceiving the elf smiths. Celebrimbor is the main guy who's going to be a major figure in the series. The two of them, you know, forge the Rings of Power as a kind of group project, which does not go well. Eventually, Sauron tries to take them all back and tries to grind them all into a pulp and in fact kills Celebrimbor and it gets really ugly after that. In the end, Sauron is a real problem, right? So after Numenor falls, the last of the Numenorians come over, and that's when you get the last alliance of elves and men, right? So the last remaining elves who are over in Middle-earth, and Elendil and his sons, Isildur and Inarion, the last of the Numenorians who have established their new realm, Gondor has been founded. They come together and they fight against Sauron, and that's the scene at the beginning of the Peter Jackson films, with the overthrow of Sauron and the cutting of the ring from his hand. But that's the end of the Second Age. The overthrow of Sauron after the Battle of the Last Alliance, Elendil dies, Gilgalad dies. That's the end of the Second Age. But Sauron's not dead. He loses his physical form and he sort of flees, his spirit flees, but he gets better eventually. Like he slowly kind of rebuilds his power until he's able to take shape again and cause trouble again. And that's what's happening at the end of the Third Age when the Lord of the Rings story proper begins. Of course, culminating with when finally the ring is destroyed and Sauron defeated permanently, which again, you overcome the big bad, you end the age. That's the end of the Third Age and the Fourth Age starts. So that's sort of the outline for how that works. So the second age, we're talking about everything that happens in this show, according to Tolkien's chronology, is thousands of years, anywhere from three to 5,000 years before the events of The Lord of the Rings. So millennia and millennia we're talking about here. Now, again, I don't know what they're going to do with the time frame. They're certainly going to compress it because the events that they're going to be describing in this show, according to Tolkien's chronology, take the place over the, over the course of a couple of millennia. And there's no way they can do that. Or they're going to have to, like, the human characters are going to be dying of old age every 10 minutes you know, throughout the show. And I, I doubt they'll do that, right? So obviously they're going to have to compress that. How they do that is, to me, one of the most fascinating things that I'm most interested to see. What else is out there?
The first thing that I was amazed by with this is all of the buildup, of course, for the trailer and for the, the TV show, mostly elves. Well, elves and Numenor, right? Because, of course, those are the stories that we know from the first stage. We know, of course, the Rings of Power and the forging of the Rings of Power with the elves and, and Sauron. And, of course, we know about the island of Numenor, where the humans who are kind of being rewarded after the first stage were, were sent and they built this huge empire and everything. The rise and fall of Numenor, huge deal. And the trailer opens touching on those things, but not really focused on those things at all. Instead, we get the perspective of a Middle-earth Hobbit perspective. And so this, of course, brings up one of the questions that people have had about, you know, the, the series. People are like, Hobbits in the Second Age, what the heck? And I would just remind people here, there is no reason to think that Hobbits didn't exist in the Second Age. It is true that we have no stories of Hobbits prior to the Third Age. So the opportunity to get to see Hobbits in the Second Age that's a lot of fun. Now you may ask, why? Why would you shoehorn them into the story? Well, keep in mind, the story that we know from Tolkien's materials in the Second Age, again, it's very limited. He never wrote the story of the Second Age. It doesn't exist in Tolkien's writings. We get summaries, we get lists of major things that happened, but we don't get a full, you know, he never wrote a full account of the Second Age. This woman here is one of our proto-hobbits, uh, one of our Harfoots. We seem to learn some things about her and about her culture in these first 20 seconds. There's wonders in this world beyond our wandering. Wonders in this world beyond our wandering, right? That suggests probably that the hobbits that they're depicting, the Harfoots, may be a nomadic people, but also with a sense of something else, that there are wonders in the world, right? Maybe some memories of ancient days that exist. They know of these, there are these big places out there in the world that they seem to be vaguely aware of and are being drawn towards. And I actually love that because that's a major theme of sort of humans and elves interacting in Tolkien's world. Not that we get that mostly, especially in the first age, way back in the distant days prior to what is going to be described here in the series. But that humans come into the stories and they first interact with elves when they they have like legends and, uh, and ideas that there is light in the West and that there's something greater out there that they can go and find. And that's how eventually they come into contact with the elves and end up allying with them in the first age. And we can hear hints of that same kind of idea from our apparently our our harfoot folks and i think this is really this is really cool and you can see in the very first sequence it starts off with a glimpse of what is almost certainly a numenorean city following the quite complicated ship right beneath the fancy arch and then we see the great city in the harbor this is almost certainly a city in Numenor if I had to guess I would say this is the city of Romana on the the eastern part of the island but anyway this is clearly a Numenorean city you know so it starts off with giving us a visual image of the great things that are out there, right? But the voice that we're hearing is from that Middle Earth perspective. And that's a fascinating frame for this entire uh, this entire show, the entire action here. And I think that was, that was the thing that most, more than anything else, blew me away, that we started from the perspective of that Harfoot spokesman. And uh, it really sets things up in a very interesting way. I love the scene. Of course, I mean, a lot of this is filmed in New Zealand, which is going to please lots of people. There's a well-established track, track record of people accepting New Zealand as Middle Earth, right? What I love of this wide shot that we get with those two hunters is how wild it looks, right? I mean, from here, it looks like you can see as far, you know, like you see, you know, miles and miles and miles, and there's no evidence of any civilization at all. And that, again, that feels very second age of Middle Earth. After the horrible destruction of the first age, right? There had been thriving civilizations and they got wrecked, right? They got just, again, ground into powder by Morgoth in the first age and everybody died. But his orcs were running all over everything and wrecking stuff until the big war, you know, the War of Wrath, as it was called at the end of the first age. So the bad guys all get destroyed and contained. The good guys have already been destroyed and then of the survivors, most of them get deported. I mean, pleasantly deported, right? The elves get invited back to Valinor and the humans get taken to Numenor. Middle Earth, like what was, like everything that was there in the parts of it are desolate, right? And so I, so I love that about this shot. There are still 
little pockets, but compared to the first stage, they're small little pockets, places where the few elves who remain, for instance, are staying. And other than that, you're going to have vastly open land. And I love the idea of like nomadic hunter peoples who are, you know, sort of working through this place. And that sense that they have that we hear the narrator speaking of, of something greater, right, that's out there, would easily be inspired by ruins that they find, you know, like there, because there will be some evidence. So I love Action Galadriel. Love it. I just I just love it. And this is one of the things that I've been I've had a lot of conversations already on social on social media about this. Especially people who know and love the Peter Jackson films have this indelible image of the incredibly regal and elegant Kate Blanchett in her flowing white dress, speaking slowly and in mysterious tones, right to Frodo. And so the idea of a Galadriel who's jumping around and hanging by her fancy dagger from the ice, wearing chainmail, riding a horse into battle, apparently at the head of a, a squad. It seems jarring. It's my favorite part. I am psyched. I am psyched for the Rings of Power Galadriel. And here's why. People underestimate is how much younger Galadriel was at this point. It's really actually a very big deal. Now, it's hard because a lot of people say, but hang on a second, aren't elves immortal? They don't even age. And she was born a long time before this, like hundreds, if not thousands of years before this. So she's already thousands of years old. So she's a few more thousand years old, but she's immortal, who cares? Like a lot of people have this idea that elves are frozen. That was not Tolkien's idea of elves at all. Last September was published a book, The Nature of Middle-earth, which is an incredibly fascinating book. This is the first set of newly published material on Middle Earth we've had in like decades, since like the 90s. But, well, maybe not, but in almost 20 years, basically. One of the things that he does a lot of in this book is he talks about elvish ages and aging, and he keeps bringing it back to mortal equivalents. He very much does imagine his elves having a kind of life cycle and growth and maturation cycle, which is parallel to, it's not on the same scale. You know, they're like different ratios. Like they, they may age at like 144 years to one, but they do age and they do progress. And in fact, he spends a lot of time. In fact, he does it like five different times. He calculates the exact age of Galadriel like her maturity level, in the end decides that at the beginning of the second age, in other words, right around where this series is taking place, Galadriel is the mortal equivalent of 21. Whereas in the third age, when we meet her in the Lord of the Rings, when we meet Kate Blanchett, Galadriel, she is 54 in mortal equivalents. She's a senior statesman beginning to contemplate retirement. So I like this. What exactly is happening here? What's going on? Is this a private quest of hers? Is this part of a flashback from earlier on? Also possible. But I really like with what they're doing with the Galadriel character. I think I watched it two or three times before I exact, I mean, I could see that like cool archery was happening, but that he's actually catching the arrow and then shooting that same arrow back. It was at least twice or three times I watched it before I really tracked. I think that's really fun. So the Sylvan Elves, once again, a made up character. Yeah, because we have exactly two named characters of the Sylvan Elves, Legolas's dad and Legolas's grandpa, <laughs> right? But those are exactly the two named elves that we know of. Unless they want to tell a story about the king of the elves of Mirkwood, they're not going to, you know, they have to make up a character. So that we're going to be getting the Sylvan Elves involved is, I think, appropriate and interesting. I mean, I like seeing the sort of diversity of elvish culture in Middle-earth, which is really diverse and especially, especially in the Second Age, because in the Second Age, you get few isolated strong holds of the high elves of the first age, those the ones who didn't leave, Gilgalad, Celebrimbor, Galadriel. And they're still running these gorgeous, sophisticated kingdoms. But then there are lots of other elves out there who are scattered and who live in the woods. Uh, Sylvan means like wood elves. They are, in The Hobbit, they're called wood elves, right? And that's, and that's what we're seeing. Tolkien gave very little in the way of physical description. We actually know very little about even central characters. What color is Mary's hair 
No idea. He never says. Tolkien spends lots of time describing landscape, very little time describing people. Tolkien never even mentions whether or not, in the text, never mentions whether or not Aragorn has a beard. He, he gets asked that by a fan. And when he's asked, he's like, oh, Aragorn does not have a beard. Absolutely not. And then he goes into this whole world building thing, giving the fan who asked, it was like a, a woman who said like she had like a, a debate with her friend, whether or not Aragorn had a beard. Can you settle this, Professor Tolkien? And he launches into this whole like world building about the history of the line of stewards. It's awesome. Like it's like a hundred times more than this person asked for. So like he knows the answer to the question, but he didn't answer the question because Tolkien does not describe people. If somebody asks me the question, do I believe that Tolkien pictured most or all of these characters as light-skinned? I think that in his mind's eye, yes, he was picturing them as white. But here's here's where it gets complicated. When he does world building, right, when he was writing and doing his maps, for instance, he said things like, so Minas Tirith is about the latitude of central Italy and Umbar, the city down in the south where the Southrons come from, is about the latitude of um, Carthage in North Africa. In other words, all of the southern front of the Lord of the Rings, right? Gondor and all of that. So that means that uh, Dal Amroth down on the southern shore of Gondor would have been about the latitude of like Morocco, southern Spain perhaps. Do you want to be true to what you think Tolkien was probably imagining? Or do you want to be true to what Tolkien said about the world? And again, Numenor. Numenor is on the equator. So when we meet the Numenorians, in theory, they will have been a culture living on the equator for thousands of years. I see no reason to think, based you know from Tolkien's story, that they should be Viking-looking white folks. I think it's fair to say most mysterious element is the meteor thing. And we don't know what it is or where it's coming from. So we then get a shot of who I'm almost positive is Gilgalad, apparently looking, at least we see him looking up right after we've seen the thing flying by. I don't know if he's actually looking at that thing or not, or they're suggesting that he is anyway. I love the shot of Gilgalad because it's looking concerned, wondering what's happening. It's a very, I've got a bad feeling about this kind of shot, right? He knows that something is coming and it's not good, but he doesn't really know what it is. Him standing in the semi-darkness by himself in the shot, this idea of like, I stand alone against the darkness that we get from this. I kind of like that. He is the High King and it kind of looks like that. We cut from there to the brief shot of Galadriel in full armor leading a cavalry charge, apparently. Well, I say cavalry charge. They don't have weapons out. Anyway, they're going very fast on horseback in armor is what we see. No idea whom she's leading here. Are these elves? Are they humans? And again, action Galadriel, leadership role right out in front of everybody. What's not to love? From here, we go to Torch Guy facing, I've heard called an ice troll and certainly seems to have ice on him. And there's definitely ice seems in the background of the cave. This I think is your like creature feature shot. And there are going to be cool CGI monsters like is one of the things that we're seeing here. I love the dwarf shot here. Vanity Fair tells us this is Durin the Fourth, right? One of those Durins whose names we can extrapolate but know nothing about. But presumably, uh, since his name is Durin, ruler of Khazad-dûm, what will later be called Moria, but will not yet be Moria. Moria means the Black Pit. It was called that after the embarrassing Balrog incident, prior to the Balrog incident, when it was just Khazad-dûm. young, extremely displeased looking Elrond in this scene. He's got his fancy armor. There's people celebrating in the background that looks like they might be dwarves. Has he been sent on a some kind of ambassadorial embassy that is not going well? That seems likely. That Elrond would be sent on such a mission is of course exactly what Gilgalad would do. Suggests to me further evidence that we're going to be getting a lot of that kind of intrigue, political, trying to form alliances and move forward and and things. I've seen a lot of people asking, and even some complaining, that Elrond doesn't have long flowing elvish hair. What's up with that? 
No, it's a Peter Jackson thing. We don't know anything about elf hair. Again, we know something about the color of some of the elves' hair, but we know literally nothing about how long they're... There's no reason to think that elves had long hair. There's no reason to think they had short hair either. But that is totally not a book detail. That is absolutely a movie thing. It's like the Kate Blanchett thing, right? Like, and I get it. Like, again, I totally understand people who have grown up with the Peter Jackson films. And so, like, to them, the visuals of the elves, the long-haired elves in Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings, that's what elves look like. And so to have them not look like that is some kind of hideous violation of... Uh, but it's not. It has nothing to do with the text. She's singing, which is awesome. I love that. My One of my favorite things in the trailer, actually. I mean, it's almost like a Tolkien Easter egg. You know, singing is super important in Tolkien's world. Like singing is a creation happened through singing, right? And that which is usually called magic is most powerfully done through song. And it's something that's really hard to depict well on screen. Peter Jackson rarely attempted it. Somebody singing and the singing, the song that you're singing, making things happen. So she's singing. This is a ritual moment. She's in very fancy garb with the gold dust on her hands, which is like dwarf makeup. Kind of love that, actually. What's the deal with everyone saying that dwarven women are meant to have beards? Is that from the books? No, she does not. So this is, this is, it's like a bizarre fan fascination. Tolkien never says dwarven women have beards. He says they rarely wander around. And when they do, they're often mistaken for dwarven men, meaning like they keep to themselves and like you don't know that it's a woman. That they have beards is not in the text. It's a joke that Peter Jackson made and everybody loved. It's true you don't see many dwarf women. And in fact, they are so alike in voice and appearance <laughs> that they're often mistaken for dwarf men. It's the beard. And so it has become like rock solid canon in the minds of like a generation of Tolkien fans, especially movie fans, that dwarven women have beards. There is no textual justification for that at all. In the foreground looks like the Harfoot girl. Right, the one that we saw close up earlier on. So, like, and the proportions seem, she seems hobbitish. It looks like she's much shorter than the scantily clad hairy dude. Looking at this picture alone, like, this is a still. I have no idea what's going on here. She seems to be trying to pull him out of what and to where. I don't have too many Tolkien categories that would help me to explain what's going on here. There's only one recorded meteor in all of Tolkien, and no people are in it for sure. But there are two clear candidates. If this guy did arrive in a burst of flame, one would be a wizard. This would be a weird way for wizards to come to Middle-earth. Gandalf definitely does not arrive until the Third Age and Saruman and Radagast. The three wizards we know from the Lord of the Rings don't arrive until the Third Age. In some of his very later writings, Tolkien suggested that the other two wizards, the blue wizards that we never meet or know anything about, might have arrived in the Second Age, so theoretically possible. Or they could move it up and be like, oh yeah, whatever, Gandalf came early. Like The other person, of course, that this could be is Sauron. Of the theories I've heard, that's my favorite so far, that, that this is Sauron's move to disguise himself, that he's going to disguise himself as like, I have come from the West. I am like this angelic figure descended among you in order to, like, I'm a faux wizard, basically, right? Descended among you in order to uh, help you in your time of need. That's totally believable. Sauron has enough showmanship to do this. Sauron is totally associated with fire, so he could obviously pull this off. Remains to be seen for sure, yeah. This says first age flashback to me. My understanding is that in the first episode, especially maybe the first two episodes, we're gonna get a bunch of flashbacks to some things that happened in the first age. That's where that shot comes from with the two trees in the background, the still image that they released first. My understanding is that the shouting elf in the foreground, unwisely not wearing a helmet over his short hair is Finrod, Goadriel's brother who died. He's not supposed to be alive in the second age at all. Assuming, as I am assuming, that all of the scenes in this trailer are from season one. I can't see any excuse for having a battle with orcs in season one. Sauron's eventually gonna invade with orcs, but there's no way, it's, season one is way too early. Therefore, it's almost certainly a flashback. Poor Finrod here is almost completely surrounded by orcs. Now, 
the interesting thing is that if this is Finrod and if they are sticking at all close to the story of the book, instead what this is almost most likely to be is the dramatic moment when Finrod is almost killed in one of the great battles of the first age, the Dagor Bragalach, his army is cut off and surrounded by orcs and about to get annihilated. And then he is rescued by the unexpected charge of a group of men who come in and who rescue Finrod and save his life. And in exchange, he gives to the leader of the men his ring. And that's the ring that Aragorn has in the Lord of the Rings. The ring that like distinguishes him as the king. That ring gets handed down from the human who saves Finrod Felagund in that scene way back in the first age through the entirety of the, of like the 3000 years of Numenor third age. And th so it's like that ring when Arag Aragorn is wearing a ring that has been in his family for for like uh, 7,000 years. This looks like the scene when Finrod is about to get rescued and uh, give away his ring that Aragorn is gonna be one day wearing. In general, I'm encouraged. I love the look and the sound of it. I think it's beautiful. I see every reason to think that, you know, visually, artistically, it's going to be excellent. It's going to be, I love the, I love everything that I've seen. I well, almost every, I can't say I love everything, but I've loved most of what I've seen of like the costuming and the sets and the props and the landscape and everything. I think that they, they seem to be doing a great job with all that stuff. As I've said, I really enjoy what they're doing with the elf stories, Galadriel in particular. I'm excited to see the thing, if I'd say worries, the meteor crater worries me a little bit one of the things like if they go too far out of their way to just be like and now a fight with a monster and let's bring in a battle that could become really forced and have an unfortunate effect on the unfolding of the story but so far i'm very encouraged i'm really liking what i am seeing so far and the speculations the lines of speculation that the trailer is leading me into turn out um, then I'll be pretty pleased. I think I see evidence that they're doing some really clever adaptation and some really thoughtful adaptation. If you're after even more Rings of Power, make sure to watch our trailer breakdown.